All right, if someone could hit start, thank you very much. Okay, so um, my name is Tinashe. Um, we are in Advanced R um, Book Club. This is chapter five in Control Flow. I'm gonna start sharing my screen. Um, I am one of those people who has the camera on one side and the screen on the other side, so I am paying attention. But if I do miss something out in like um, questions or anything, feel free to shout. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm just gonna like use the previous uh, slides, but hopefully we'll have a little bit more um, discussion. And if anybody has questions, we can also jump into um, a code window and check it out. Um, so control flow was chapter five. We're talking about choices. Wait, and we're were you going to share your screen? Yes. I, I can't see it. Can anyone else see it? OK, okay. Sorry, I just wanted to just double check. Yeah, thank you for that. I guess I didn't. There you go. I got How's it. that? Thanks. Okay, AV check. Can I get some thumbs up? Awesome. Thank you, guys. Um, okay, so uh, two types of control flow tools. We call them choices and loops. Um, and they're pretty self-explanatory um, until you get to loops, which like I really do want to talk about. Um, but yeah, self-explanatory on the face of it. So choices, ifs and elses. Um, you know, if you've been programming enough that you are interested in the advanced R um, curricula, then you probably know choices are just about like the computer's reading some code and you're just telling the computer to do something if one thing is true or if it's false, right? Um, so the way that we do that in R, we just use an if and then the condition in brackets and then uh, whatever um, evaluates as true from that condition. We then uh, enact it using some variable, some function, some whatever. Whatever you want to return, it will be enacted if the condition is true. If not, it is false. And you can explicitly say else for that false. Importantly, the computer doesn't know when you're going to say false. It always evaluates the first thing if true. So if you want something to happen, if it's not true, you do have to be explicit. Um, and in R, we like to use uh, this um, syntax where we just sort of use uh, curly braces um, for the first expression and then curly braces for the next expression, whether it's one if else statement or if it's multiple cascading if else statements. Um, yeah, pretty straightforward. And again, stop me if anybody has any comments, any questions, um, because I cannot quite always see the chat. So feel free to shout. Um, so here's the first exercise. Um, why does this work? What we're doing is we're assigning uh, x as a vector, uh, 1 through 10. Um, if length of x, then not empty, else empty, right? And we return a not empty. My uh, understanding is that here, length of x is being evaluated as a number, right? So the length function just takes a vector and then asks how long it is, and then returns a number. And obviously, because we know that x is 10, the length of it is 10. Um, but why would an if statement evaluate 10 as true when if statements are about truth and false? The answer is that um, a lot of programming languages <clears throat> have this concept of truthiness. Um, if you talk to computer scientists, scientists they, they, they actually, they mention this like truthiness thing and how truthiness changes in different languages. Um, truthiness basically means that like, when you're, when you're, when you're developing a, a, a coding language, um, you have to default to some kind of decision about logicals because logicals are, you know, like we've talked about there, like, so fundamental in computer science um, that you need to decide like everything can eventually cascade to being a logical. It turns out that in R, um, any number that is non-zero, I believe, any number that is non-zero evaluates to a true. It cascades down to a logical true. Um, so length x is returning a not zero which means that it ends up returning a true, which is like kind of esoteric, 
right? Because you can imagine writing some sort of function um, that like does all sorts of complicated things. And then you get this weird error where it's like, okay, well, why are you returning me a true? Like I didn't like whatever. It's usually because of something like this. You might be evaluating something that's non-standard that cascades down to being a true. Um, so in the same way, when we set X as just numeric, numeric function just returns zero. It just returns a flat, I think, I believe an integer zero. And that gets evaluated as a false. And that's why we have the um, return being an empty here. Um, and then we can also use um, return values um, in our if-else statements. Oh, before I continue, I just want to say again, any questions, please feel free to shout or comments or anything. Um, so when we do a return value, oh, do you see a comment? Is true X is a really specific test of whether something is true? Yes. Thank you, Steffi. Um, that is a very, very useful way. Um, and like, I guess like this is a good point to like just mention like as as you get more and more involved in R or any programming language really, um, you'll notice that you get more and more atomic in the way that you work with the language. Um, so the first time that you work in R, you might have been introduced by like R for DS, um, where everything is a, is a table, everything is a tibble, um, and it has all of these attributes and everything, but you can't always rely on that, like doing is true on a tibble. Um, so you'll find yourself working with more and more like granular things until you get to like straight up values like this. And this, and that's why like learning um statements like is true um is super useful thank you Steffi. um okay so um returning values uh for if else statements should be super straightforward uh just in the same way that if we wrote this um if length x x not empty else empty it does return a value that's why you see this like little one over here you can just take that value and just assign it to whatever variables you want cool um, so one thing, um, that's pretty useful, um, is that, uh, if you use a single argument, uh, without an if else statement, you, it returns invisibly. So that's kind of what I was getting at in the, in the, uh, last slide. Um, but, uh, it returns null if the condition, uh, is false. So you can get functions like C, paste, um, they'll drop null inputs and that can make things like really easy and compact. So here we have a function um, that's going uh, single if without else. Uh, you can then put that into um, a function that has this like if birthday, then it returns whatever. But um, the pasto, which is super fun, super useful by the way, definitely use a pasto. Um, you get a number, uh, you're then invisibly returning stuff. If not, um, sorry, you get a number and you're pasting uh, lane onto the uh, first argument. And then uh, once, you've, once you're done that, you'd say, if the number is greater than one, then you start pasting and repeating um, those arguments over and over. Um, cool. Uh, any questions about that? I see you see a chat. Let's see here. Uh -huh. Pesto. Yes. Um, so paste, I want to, yeah, I do actually, I should actually shout out Pesto. Definitely don't use paste by default. Um, paste is a useful function, um, but use Pesto because again, like I was talking about previously, the better you get at using your language, the more granular you're going to get. Pesto is a more granular version. It gives you a little bit more control. Um, so when it comes to um, sticking things together in certain chains, I, I, I remember we talked about, um, we did talk about how like vectors, if you have a vector of one and a vector of three, you can then repeat one to one, one to two, one to three, that kind of thing. Pasto allows you to do that. So I would definitely refer to uh, Pasto as often as possible. Gabby says, I have always had problems coming out in ways to use if else, et cetera, in my functions. I guess the best example is a function. If the package is not installed, then install it. Yes. 
Uh, but I was wondering if anyone else had examples on your blog or GitHub, please share them here or on Slack. Um, yes. Uh, so this is a this is a very this is a very good example. Um, if the function, uh, if the package is installed, then please, if this package is not installed, then please install it. Um, very, very common to see, like if you're, if you're sharing stuff um, with like colleagues or uh, friends or whatever, um, obviously you're worried about like, do they have this specific package? So a lot of people, you, we used to use um, a package called packrat um, that uh, used to have a function pack. And if you go to the source code of pack, it does exactly this. It does an if else, where it just lists out the stuff that you have in your current environment. And if you don't have it, it installs it for you. As we get further and further, I'm not sure in this book, but as you get further and further in R, you're probably gonna come across a package called Renv, R-E-N-V, which does exactly that. It is the successor to Packrat. And so Gabby, I definitely advise you to like go ahead and look at that um, because it will, it'll be a good example um, that will sort of uh, reflect your experience. Uh, yeah, Peso is awesome. Ooh, Lou as well, Lou is cool. <laughs> um, okay, uh, I'm gonna move forward to the next slide. All right. So um, when we're talking about the inputs to an if else statement, um, the condition must evaluate to a single true or to a single false. Um, so like I mentioned before, a single number gets coerced to a logical type. Um, so you can see here, that returns a one, that returns a one, that returns a one. And that's because there's this cascading, this idea of like cascading importance of, um, uh, of data types um, in R. Are there any distinctions between paste and glue? And we can discuss that later. Um, yes, there are. And we should discuss that at the end. So, uh, so funny if you if I forget to bring that up, please uh, ping us again so we can talk about it. Um, if the condition can't evaluate to a single true or false, the um, error that's when you get an error. So, if else statements are rare ish, um, but usually it's because you're not evaluating something that can be um, cascaded down to zero or one. I found this really interesting. Text, just plain text, doesn't cascade down to a logical value. But the text true does. As for why that happens, I wish I was a software developer and I could explain it to you. Um, but this is a good like indication that you should never, you should never really be relying on typing the words true or false in text in text variables. Um, so again, numeric zero is not one. That's an error because we can't evaluate um, the numeric of zero because it's not of, because the length of it is zero. Um, NAs can't be evaluated as true or false because again, they're like one of those base data types that we don't cascade further down to logicals. Um, and this is um, something that I learned when I was going through this book. I did not know this before, this R check length condition. Um, there are a lot of like really esoteric settings that you can find in R by like just going through like if you type options and uh, brackets, that's where things like this will live. Um, so if you're ever a little bit like curious or are facing something like really, really important that you want to uh, check, you know, feel free to like go through like what are your options in your current environment. Um, cool. I see a couple more comments here. Okay, so Steffi, on the comment of um, if else statements, Steffi says she uses them a lot when evaluating different arguments in a function. So if the function could have been an argument blue or green, use if else to deal with it um, or switch, which we're going to get to soon. Um, if the argument is something like total versus summary, uh, you can use an if else to do different calculations based on the argument. Totally true. Um, argument evaluation is a very, very important thing that like you don't really think about until somebody throws you into a situation where they've got like 17 arguments and you're like, oh my gosh, what am I supposed to do here? <laughs> um, if anybody uses uh, chunk options in quarter or markdown, make them don't, 
don't make the mistake of forgetting that in those cases, it, it's, uh, it really is true and not true. Yes, so there is a difference between, um, actually, this is very, this is interesting because in Python, you can evaluate this guy um, as false because it doesn't have a capital T. Python needs a capital T true, while R needs all capitals true. So this would evaluate as false in Python, but in R as true. <laughs> so uh, yeah, <laughs> weird, uh, weird little uh, distinctions there. All right, um, let's move along. Vectorized choices. So if else is a vectorized version of if, um, which is basically to say that if uh, you want to run an if else statement multiple times over, don't do if else on each argument. Don't repeat yourself, D-R-Y, dry. Don't repeat yourself. Um, just make it a vector and run if else on the entire vector. Um, so you can see here, um, which we're going to get to loops soon, you can just imagine that like if x is a vector with one to 10, it's a variable that has 10 items. Uh, if you do if else, this first argument here is going to do if else on everything. The second argument of if else is the condition when true. And the third argument of if else is the condition when false. Uh, so you can see 1 through 10, we're modulo uh, 5 equals to 0. Um, and if we find a number in the vector 1 through 10 that is divisible by 5, then we're going to return the true. If not, we're just going to return the character version of um, that argument. You can see 1, 2, 3, 4. The fifth, modulo 10, evaluates 0. You get an xxx. And the tenth, xxx. Cool. dplyr then implemented uh, their own if else, uh, which, like, the phrase that, that uh, I liked when I first read about it was syn syntactic sugar. dplyr's if else is basically syntactic sugar for this vectorized if else. Um, why do I say that? Because syntactic sugar is a, a phrase that just means that like we're making it a little bit easier to read. We're making it a little bit easier to um, to handle for uh, the average programmer who doesn't want to deal with like weird errors or things like that. Um, our conclusion from the first two sections is that if any text will always return false. Very good question, Leo. Let's see. So argument is not interpretable, interpretable as a logical, right? What did we see before? Um, right here, text. Error and if text argument is not interpreted as logical. Why is that happening? Because the text, any text, cannot be coerced down in cascading values to its basic data type, which would be true, which would be false, right? It it can't be coerced, so it turn it returns a, an error. Whereas we can test it here if we do true. Um, Make sense? If true, one, but if any text, one, error, any text cannot be interpreted as logical. So again, like going back to like chapter one, like we're thinking about the most granular data types that are available in R. If we were to take any text and try to make it more and more and more and more granular, like how could we make this as simple as possible? Any text can't be interpreted as a logical value. But um, the word true is made up of four letters. Um, but if we interpret it as a computer, you could cascade down that order of importance until you're like, OK, it kind of looks like true. <laughs> um, and that's just a software development thing. You know, Don't overthink it. Different languages have different ways of dealing with this problem. Yeah, cascading to true is, it's, and and like I mentioned earlier, it's different in different languages. Um, if you look up, 
the um I believe it's double question marks um, in Java. There is a huge argument in JavaScript and Java about like how to evaluate things. It's nuts. <laughs> so yeah, if you want to see some drama, go on the internet and look up like truthiness in Java. It's really, really messed up. Is it true for others like false or NA? Let's check. Um, if false one, did not return an error, but if I do... Probably return null, right? Yeah, it's returning the null, right? Mm -hmm. Good, good guess. Um, Could you put an exclamation in front of it to reverse it? Is that like a thing? Yeah, we could try that. Yeah, you can, yeah, you or can always do this. Inside the brackets, I think, right? Inside the bracket. And, yeah, ooh, it's that's part a, of the logical operation. That's a very good question. If not false. No, it doesn't like it. Okay, that makes me yeah. feel better though. I would have been really unhappy if it liked that. I don't think you can do not text. No, I think so. Yeah. So I guess you could do if false, um, you know, one else zero. Yeah. If text false. Yeah, yeah, exactly. One. <laughs> and then else zero. And we should get zero. There yeah. we go. Yeah. We have zero. That is messed up. That I'm is not super funny. With that. <laughs> no, I, but I, this is that was a very good experiment. That was very cool. <laughs> um, awesome, so awesome. It just only works for true and false, or is NA is also key? Oh yeah, we just, didn't try NAs. Yeah, funny. You, yeah, you're right. Basically, is it yeah, yeah? Is it like a keyword inside uh, uh, the reserved words that is looking for? I'm, I'm, uh -huh. I'm confused a little bit. We can look into that for sure. Is it the same as if you, yeah, I think you can't really. Oh, no, it isn't interpretable because it gives you a different error message. NA is not evaluable as well. Um, okay, so it sounds like the reserved words true and false. It sounds like the text for the words true and false are being sent to the reserved words true and false mm -hmm. in programming. But it sounds like the NA value, which is a reserved data type, is not being evaluated by if else. Does that make sense? Try uh, if C reserved, which is a reserved word. Oh, if C. Um, yeah. I think it has mm -hmm. to be in quotes, otherwise it's a function. Oh, put it in right. Yeah. So the yeah, so the function itself. I mean, I I guess is does NA get coerced to a function at the end of the day? <laughs> I I am not in my interpretation from this is that yes, it applies to true and false, and it doesn't apply to the others because uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, the NA doesn't give it gives different error messages, so it's definitely being treated differently, and it gives the same error message you give it for any text string. Yeah, and um, I would say the same thing for the other the other yeah. ones. Yeah, I totally agree, Steffi. I think it's I think it's a situation where um, something has been done in in the source code to cascade down the texts true and false and it sounds like it was probably just a design choice more than I, it was like some yeah. higher power and i would definitely not use that because i i could see that being oh, yeah. something that people got rid of in future because it sounds super dangerous oh yeah oh yeah <laughs> absolutely um yes good question funny thank you for bringing that up um cool anything else on the um invalidness of different conditions. Okay, let's move on to vectorized choices. Um, oh, no, we already, just, we already just, we're going to switch now. Okay, uh, so switch statements. I had a hard time wrapping my head around them the first time that I saw them, uh, but they're very, very useful. They're very, very valuable. Um, if you go to any other programming language as well, like most programming languages have an equivalent of a switch statement. Um, R doesn't seem to like make them obvious in most learning, but knowing this is super, super useful. 
And the basic idea is, you know, you take that whole idea of like, if else, if else, if else, just put it into one statement, make it easy, make it um, easier to uh, read, make it easier to access. Um, so if, uh, so we have a function uh, where we have some variable that we uh, want to evaluate, and then we have different ways of evaluating it using this uh, variable type. Uh, so switch type basically says, take this type, look at what it is, and then based on how we can evaluate this, use either of the functions that we define or returns or whatever um, in the switch statement. So um, the easiest way to do this is just to look at it in practice, right? Um, so if we have this function center, it takes an input um, from, it takes an input from these vectors and it says, um, if the vector is uh, given to this function and the second argument type is mean, then we want to take the mean of this vector. Why? Because the switch statement set, looked at the type, it looked at this string, and then pulled out the mean function, or was told to pull out the mean function. Um, it evaluates the string as the argument here that with an unquoted string. So I'm not quite sure how and why it does that. Um, but I think that like when you see it in practice, it's pretty straightforward. Um, so you can see here somebody just uh, using that example, um, just going different uh, statistical summarizations of a bunch of uh, numbers, and then uh, using supply, which we're going to get to in a little bit, um, and then developing a data data frame um, that can display the difference between the mean, a median, and the trend values. Um, one thing that's important is that switch functions have this habit of falling through, which, I mean, I guess I've been using the word cascading a lot in this um, talk, but you can think of it as the same thing. Um, if switch doesn't have an argument, you can actually just throw a comma on there. And then whatever comes in just cascades down to the next value. So it is, you know, order specific. If you're using this falling through um, approach strategy, definitely like take a look at your order and make sure that that's, that that's right. Um, and then always add a um, an error case at the end, because if this X is not found in here, um, what's switch supposed to do? You have to tell it explicitly, like, here's how I want you to exit the function um, if we don't find what we're looking for. Um, gonna address some comments. I think you can quote or not in switch labels like a name vector or list. That's a very good point. Um, is it true for other false? Address that. I think we addressed those questions, right? Um, case and when in SAS. So I'm not familiar with SAS to be able to um, answer that question. If anybody is, please feel free to make a reply um, in this thread. Um, but yes, I'm I'm assuming that it's going to be very similar to um, case when, case when, case when, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Cool. Uh, thank you, Fanny. Um, so let's move on to R's case when. <laughs> um, so Dplyr then wrote a uh, that the folks at um, our studio at Posit wrote Dplyr case when, um, and this is generally the same as like a switch and an if else like put together um again for like syntactic sugar to make things look nice and feel easy um so you can see the uh syntax here i'm gonna be honest i started using case wins like maybe four years ago or so um but to this day i do not remember the syntax for case when so do not feel bad <laughs> if you have to look it up every single time that you want to use it Know what you want to use, but always go to the documentation. <laughs> um, so uh, for here, we're doing the same thing as we had in the previous slide. But uh, dplyr's way of writing it out is you put that uh, first argument of what uh, value that you're looking at. 
Um, and then you do a double equals instead of a single equals. And then you give your first argument of what you want to evaluate. And then you use the tilde over here um, to then give what function you want to use at the end. So evaluate it as if you evaluate mean, then I want tilde do a mean. If I want a median, then do tilde median. Um, and just like with switch, uh, you should give a default type. Um, it wasn't until actually reading through this book that I realized there's a dot default argument. I always used to do it manually, like shown here, because again, we go through each of these one by one. I always used to do it manually, even in case when I used to do it manually to be like, hey, one, two, three, and four is where you should stop. If you get to four, then do this. But uh, dplyr's case when does have a dot default argument, which means that you can put it anywhere you want in this um, uh, function definition here. Uh, cool. Let's take a look at the comment. Case match is another option, more similar to base switch, but I can't say I'm very comfortable using it. Yeah, case match is, I hope my um, help thing is gonna work. Um, case match. Uh, and you can see it's vectorized there. Let's go straight to the file. All right, I'll just look it up. Essentially, it's just the same syntax as switch, because like with case when, you, each one of those lines doesn't have to be the same logical question, right? It doesn't have to be like mm -hmm. center is mean. It could be like, is this true and this true and that true? Or is this true and that true, like combined with this? So it gives you case switch, uh, switch has a lot of flexibility in terms of how you're going to like, I use it for categorizing stuff in like in yeah. data frames a lot of the time. Um, and then case match is pretty much a drop and replacement for I think the switch function. Uh-huh. Yeah, I see that. I can see that here. It's a little bit more compact. Uh-huh. This is good. Yeah, this is useful because you could imagine um some scenario where and you said you use it like in, in um data frames, right? Because yeah, you can so... put it into like if you're doing a tidy verse, you know, style mm -hmm. of, of manipulating your data, you can put it into a mutate so that you can kind of like just create Perfect. a new problem that categorizes based on, you know, anything you want really. So uh -huh. that's where uh -huh. I use it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so if you're, let's say you're going through Iris um, and you want to go over each row and you're just saying if, um, and you could do it numerically too, I imagine you mm -hmm. could say if sepal width is between two numbers, yeah. then the output is here. And that would be very verbose in a case when, because you would have to, in fact, I don't even know if it would be possible in a case when. No, it would be, you'd have to do it in a case when actually, um, because you would say sepal width is greater than X tilde, the result in a case match is to limp to, I think what you're talking oh, about. Oh yeah, yeah, I had another idea. Like, yeah. yeah, you couldn't do it in a case match. Yeah, yeah you couldn't do it in a case match, but, um, but a case match would be, useful if you want to just say like the two um let's say like you want to say is this a satosa or not satosa yeah exactly like yeah. if it's in the other two categories and you then you list it out as a vector then give me the output of that yeah um yeah, yeah okay that's cool that's awesome definitely good to know okay can you repeat that i'm just a little lost is it Closer to the formats, you know, what, what could be the difference? You know, in the, even the formats, what we do is we assign some numerical values to the categorical values, right? Mm -hmm. And you keep on going down. And uh, the case match, and how does it dis is different from that? Or is this another way of doing it? I think the, the best way to think about it is actually just this example here. Um, case match. Mm -hmm. the the best or not the best but the recommended way to go about using it is when you have things like this oh. these multiple vector um matches that you want to get um case when like case match can work anywhere 
So you can see we're matching stuff against a singular character value A, B, C, or D. Mm -hmm. um, but the, but if we took this code and made it case when, mm -hmm. we wouldn't be able to do this. We would actually. It. Um, sorry, if I can. If yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, the case match. The difference is that um, I think it's again just switching up the two ideas. Case match says here's your vector x. Uh -huh. Is it a and b? And then it becomes low. Is it are, are the values c, d, or e? Then they become high. So you're only comparing one vector to these matches. Essentially, this vector is like every item in that vector has to be a or b, and then it becomes low. It it can be c, d, or e, and then it becomes high. But in a case when you would have to rewrite this as saying x is equivalent to a, then it becomes one. X is equivalent to B, then it becomes two. So Absolutely. it becomes much wordier, but then you can ask much more interesting things. You can say, is X equivalent to A and is Y equivalent to B? So you can start to make it, whereas the case match can only take one vector and it can only deal with that one vector. And then it's matching it. It's not asking um, logical questions. So it's not yeah. saying, is you know it greater than or less than? It's just straight up, does it match A or B? So let's try it out. So we're doing a vector of um, characters here. We have one NA in there hiding, and we're just going to do case match. Blah, blah, blah. Oops. Blah, 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 right? So we know that if it's A, return a one. If it's B, return a two, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if we change this to case when, it yeah, would still work. Idea. Yeah. Uh, right? Not as written. Not so as now, written. Now um, you get rid of the first line. Mm -hmm. And now the A, the, the, the now the first line becomes X equal equal A. Oh, gotcha. okay. Mm -hmm. And now you have to do that for every single line. So the case match is much less flexible, but yeah, mm -hmm. packed. Yeah. And here we would go is one. Uh, like and you equal, equal, a tilde, tilde one. one. Yeah. Tilde one. Just like that. So, so we would have that. to be super wordy about it. Yeah, exactly. But I think that's the, the case match is really great if you don't need to be, you know, if it's a very simple com comparison. And then case one is really nice if you do want more flexibility. Yeah. So does it make a local copy of A and B, the values, the vectors? Um, the in case the, when. In the case in, when. In the function environment. Yeah, the no, I don't think so. I don't think so. So X, X takes the value of A, and then, then it takes the value of B. It's so does it? Um, uh, I'm trying to digest that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. No, no, no. I, I totally get what you're saying. So, um, in here, what you're saying is that in here, mm -hmm. because we don't have this x argument at the top, mm -hmm. um, as we did in case match, you're asking if um, you're asking if we have to make a local copy of the variable and then evaluate each of them one by one. And that's a very good question. I don't think I know the answer. <laughs> I am going to interject here. Someone politely pointed out that we are 43 minutes after the hour. So oh um, yeah. Sorry, oh, I've yeah, been uh, sure. typing things. <laughs> that's okay. Um the default argument is used to set what any would yes. Uh to Leo, yes. The D the dot default argument is set to um if something goes wrong, usually just return that. <laughs> um, but yes, I'm going to try and and move ahead because I know that loops are like super fun to talk about um, and make sure that we all like get enough time to talk about those. So iteration, this is like one of the um, most fundamental parts of programming that everybody should think about um, for I in one through five, print one through I. Um, what you're doing is saying, okay, 
here we're setting, and uh, to your point about um, uh, functional environments, uh, Tani, um, yes, for is a function that creates a local environment and then it creates a new variable i within which you can then access each of your things. Something that's funny about R is that once this is done, you can actually print i again. It doesn't garbage collect i. It's still available. So when you're debugging um, functions, um, a good idea, if you're like debugging for loops, you could just like print i, and then you could add a line that says, if i is 4, because you know that somewhere around number 4, it breaks. Break your break your loop, and then you can access i again at that point. So just a piece of advice. Um, terminating the for loop. So like the, the next and the, so this is what I was talking about, the next and the break uh, functions. Next just basically says like, okay, if we're at this one part of the, uh, of the loop, don't do anything, keep moving, go to the next one. Um, specifically, it refers to the current i. So if you had this in a nested list and you had for i in whatever at the top, and then you said for j in whatever at the at, uh, within that, um, if you do a next in j, it's only going to go to the next j. It's not going to skip to the next i. So keeping an eye on keeping an eye on your um, i's and j's and k's um, is very important. So even though like it's in most programming languages, I recommend against using just like straight up i's, j's, k's for your iterators. Definitely just name them. Your programming language doesn't care. Um, okay, let's take a look at some comments very quickly. Um, a small example the Iris data set as Tibble Iris, and generator queen names mutate. Um, is Satosa case match? I don't know if I have generator installed in this environment, but we can take a look. All right, I don't have generator installed in this uh, particular environment, but if we have time, I will definitely run this because this is a very good example. Um, I think it makes me feel like a mathematician. <laughs> yes, I, I feel the same way. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. So this exercise, when the following code is evaluated, what can you say about the vector being iterated? I looked at um, some of the uh, previous um, book clubs on uh, on this topic, and the discussion was interesting, but I wanted to get any thoughts from you guys in the remaining time that we have because I'm not gonna I'm not gonna give give it away, <laughs> or at least I'm not gonna give away my thoughts. I guess my question was like I found the question ambiguous. What yeah. can we say about the vector being iterated? And like it's a vector; it's being iterated, it's being added to, it's being copied in place. Uh, I wasn't really sure yeah. <laughs> what kind of questions. Uh, answers the question was looking for no that's exactly that's exactly it that's exactly it um okay. the the what's interesting about this is that this is a one we're breaking a lot of like very important rules not rules but like we're doing something very very uh dangerous here um we have a vector that's three data types long um and then we're c binding the same vector and then C binding it to a new value each time. I think like the the one thing that I took away from this was I remember being an R programmer in my first like couple of weeks and doing this so many times until my professor was like, that's dangerous. <laughs> um, because if you do this with a vector that's say a million data types long, what are you gonna end up with? A million to the power of two, you know, it's like, it's dangerous. Um, so when we talk a little bit more about like, you know, we talked in the in the first uh, couple um, lessons about uh, about the lobster package and measuring how big objects are. This is a very 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 dangerous thing to do. One, you're not pre-allocating your vectors. Two, you're binding a vector to a copy of a vector over and over and over and over again. Um, in this example, we only have three, and we're ending up with six. Super dangerous. Don't do that, <laughs> is the basic takeaway. Um, OK. Um, so what we just talked about, pre-allocating output containers. And that basically means that uh, the best thing to do when you're uh, doing for loops is to just say, 
here's a uh, here's a vector that I want to loop over, and I want to get a vector of this size out at the end. Maybe you'll have to do some math about it, whatever it is. Just be prepared to make that vector before, put it into memory, look at the your use lobster to like look at how much memory you're using. You can see the allocated memory and you can then preempt if anything's gonna go wrong because there is nothing worse than running a for loop for two hours and then it breaks. <laughs> um, cool. Um, and another option is to use uh, seek along. So if you've worked in Python, you might be familiar with a function called enumerate. And what that basically does is it takes any vector and it says, okay, in the local environment for this for loop, seek along does the same thing. Um, in the local environment for the for loop, I'm going to make a new variable i. And that just does a length of my input and then says, I if i equals one, it's the first object. If i equals two, second object. If i equals three, third object. Um, seek along is similar to using length vector. Exactly. It is similar. I don't know if it's more efficient. I haven't made that test yet, but I believe it is. Um, and I would not be surprised if that is the case. Um, so what you're suggesting, Gabby, is to say um, for i in one through length xx, um, definitely just use seek along because it's easier. You can tab complete it. You know, why not? <laughs> um, and safer, yes. <laughs> OK. Uh, related tools while. Um, so we talked about four. Four just says, you've given me a vector, and each thing in that vector, I'm going to do something. While, on the other hand, is a bit of the opposite. It says, I'm going to do something until you tell me to stop. Basic idea. Um, so what you can do is you can say for this action, while condition action, if you put this into your computer right now, if you say while true, print one, your computer will set on fire eventually <laughs> because it's not been told to stop. <laughs> um, seek len. Okay, so um, Steffi asks, what's the difference between, um, or not what, Gabby asks, what's the difference between seek along and seek len? We can just take a look at it. Oh, I should probably just Google it. if anybody has actually answered it. I always get the mixed up. Seek along does the one through 10 of the following the length of an object and seek mm -hmm. len takes a number, I think, and creates the one through 10 or something like that. Um, let me, actually, I should just be able Yeah, like I'm, I'm, I'm looking for it. I'm yeah, so if you now, just seek like... len 10, it gives you essentially one through 10. So it it's um I I always just feel like it should be the, the name should be reversed though. Interesting. I think yeah, so that's why I, I think in my head I always just choose the wrong one. So I usually just try them mm. out until I get the one I like. Weird. Huh. Okay. That I I I want to look at too. Um but I think for the purpose of this meeting, Gabby, um, I would just stick with seek along for the purpose of this meeting. Um, because I like I, I I don't think I've ever come across a, a situation where I wanted to use seek len and it's it's something I guess if you need to do something on a different column in each in the data frame or whatever you'd yeah. seek len the data frame and it would just give you ten because it's it's very similar both are interchangeable depending on how yeah. you write yeah. Uh -huh. Sorry, it didn't need to take up as much time. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, no worries, no worries. Um, I think we're still good on time because we only have this left. Um, so repeat action. I have never used this before. I'm gonna be completely honest. I don't know why you would, <laughs> um, but I would love for somebody to show me an example that would be useful for a repeat. Um, 
And yeah, that was all that they had in the slides um, for this. The one thing that I do want to mention, was it in here or was it elsewhere? Yes, map and apply. Um, map and apply should be your go-to whenever you're thinking about um, looping. I think that um, there are, you know, there are benefits to just using map um, terminology, especially when you're talking to other uh, computer scientists in other languages. The phrase map reduce is how a lot of computer scientists think. Um, that's how they've been trained to think about this idea of a vector, do something to each item in that vector, and then return me some result for each of them. Map and apply do that for you, and you don't have to be as super verbose as a for loop. Um, however, I did find an interesting resource um, that suggests that apply functions are not faster than loops, which is heresy to me. <laughs> I've like I've 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 you know, lived my life thinking that the reason that we have Laply, Supply, Vapply, like all those things is because they're fundamentally faster. But um, this person, and I can send this in the um, in the chat if you guys are interested, um, suggests that they are actually not using micro benchmark so we can see the data. Like it's not just like they made it up. Um, so this is interesting. I, I am not convinced to use for loops because of this, but it is now making me bite my tongue the next time somebody says applies are better than loops. So just some interesting uh, learning for you guys today. I just feel like I've always had this um, this question, I guess. I asked John in one of the book clubs um, that I was mm -hmm. in, the R4DS. And so he said that at the beginning, this applied. Ha, no joke or no pun intended, but this thing applied in the sense that apply was or all the apply functions were faster than for loops. Uh -huh. But now he says that they're not. So I guess the way R is coded, I don't understand any of that right. uh, behind the scenes thing. So he says that now those things don't matter much anymore. Mm. My question has always been about um, so. I, I want to become like a better coder, even, even though I'm not a data scientist. So I just want to learn how to do code more efficient. Yeah. Be better at that. So my question has always been, it took me so long to learn for loops that mm. I eventually got them and I'm like, yeah, I can write them even in my sleep. So is it better to use apply or per with map, right? With all the map yeah. functions? Yeah, yeah. Is it better than using for loops? Is it more efficient? So what do data scientists think about that? Good <laughs> question. Um, I, yeah, go ahead, Diana. Sophie. I was going to say, I, I was going to say something, but I think Diana had a comment. Yes, I, I do have a comment about that. Uh, I, I, I fell in love. Uh, <laughs> I'm fell in love with, with L applies, so I always use them and, uh, R made me stop using for loops, mm -hmm. which I never thought I was gonna like do as a as a software engineer. But the the reason that I think we should learn how to use maps and 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 apply it, it's because R is mainly a functional language. I mean the the the, mm -hmm. the paradigm that it's behind R it's it's functional programming and applies our our functions and and they they actually make you write the code yep. in functional in a in a functional uh paradigm so that's why like okay they're not faster okay <laughs> but they reduce the the i don't remember how, what it's called they they reduce the the problem that for loops have like like the one we saw where you can actually like change the values of of other uh of other variables that are not inside mm. the function your function inside and an apply should be like um, closed you yeah. shouldn't 
I'm gonna I'm gonna look for the for the for the for the they're word safe or they're contained. Yes, yes, they're, it, like they're contained within yeah. an environment. Yeah. Yes, yes, and so I mean that will be that will be my answer. Like, uh, yeah. learn how to use uh, maps and apply because of functional programming. Yeah. I was going to say, I recently did a project where I used, started, like I've always used map um, and like in the per family, not always, you know, obviously, but I have used map uh, before, but I got into a project where I was using it a lot. And I have to say one thing I really liked about it was just, it made the code so much more compact, but also still legible. And yeah. I think for me, I use it more as a um, making code that's still readable and efficient. It, so not efficient in terms of space use, not efficient in mm -hmm, terms mm -hmm. of um, speed or anything like that. So yeah. that's one reason I like it. Uh, I think but it depends I on will... who you're working with. <laughs> it does, yeah, it's it, yeah, absolutely. One, one last, I mean, you, you already, already been pointed out, but one thing that I found mapping is much better is when you start using or reading the JSON files where there is, one inheritance, another inheritance within that. And so, so you know, like when you start using the for loops, uh, you know, you you can get lost mm -hmm. within, the, within the looping itself, but maps make your life easy. I mean, it, it, at least, you know, for me, who is a newbie, uh, I, I started mapping it out. And JSON files, reading the JSON files was really helpful uh, yeah. by yeah. using the maps. Yeah. No, I think I think um, one phrase that I heard used about this discussion um, was sort of the the cognitive load of different programming tasks in different languages. Um, different languages have different styles of solving problems. And what you want to do is reduce your cognitive load by not having um, too many ways of solving a problem that sort of don't work together. They don't help each other. Um, and so to uh, to your first point, Diana, R is so, so functional um, that it's always best to look for um, output equals function X, do your thing. And for loops kind of, they, they kind of, change your your cognitive mapping of how to solve a problem whereas map and similar kind of ways of approaching it are they're just like that output equals function inputs output um so yeah the um was that the idea of deep plan yes the sim similar thing one of the um one of the goals of deep Lyre was to reduce cognitive load on the programmer by making things look more the same making things feel more the same so that the way that you quote unquote speak to the computer is similar. But yeah, this is a this is an awesome discussion. Um, I am now over time. Um, so uh, I will give it to our um, facilitator uh, to say goodbyes and everything, but we can continue talking if you'd like. All right, I guess, yeah, sorry, I keep forgetting I've, I've got a job. All right, thank you everyone. <laughs> I. I, I will write end in the chat. I